Okay, and now it's time for our teaching text. Uh, Mark 1, verses 12 through 20. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. And uh, when he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of uh, Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. How many of you are doing Whole30? <laughs> pa- paleo? Gluten-free. If there's any vegans, they're going to let us know. They're going, I'm, I'm vegan. I'm ve-. Anybody? I... This is the time. How many of you have got a new budget? New budget. Apps, accountability, plans, planning retreat. Can't come out tonight. Got a planning retreat with myself. I'm just going over my life. 2018, it's going to be a big year for me. This, there is a psychological shift that happens in January where you're just like, okay, this is the year. I'm actually still the same person, but it's, it's a different year. Every, it's like magical pixie dust. It's like you sprinkle a new year on people, and I'm like, everything's going to change. There is something about the psychology of this time of year. But one of the things that I've learned uh, over the, the course of my life is that it doesn't matter what your vision is if it's pointed at the wrong thing. It doesn't matter how good you get at meaningless things. It doesn't matter. So what I would love us to do to try and re- uh, to orient our community over the course of the next six weeks is to take that psychological lift and that sense of joy and determination and point it towards the right things as a community. So we're going to be in a a series here called The Way of Jesus for the Renewal of the City, six weeks long. And tonight we're kicking it off by talking about the way of vision, making sure that we're channeling and aiming and projecting everything towards the right ends in what we do. David Brooks says this in his book, The Road to Character, you follow your desires wherever they take you. And you will prove of yourself so long as you are not obviously hurting anyone else. You figure that if the people around you seem to like you, you must be good enough. In the process, you end up slowly turning yourself into something a little less impressive than you'd originally hoped. A humiliating gap opens up between your actual self and your desired self. How many for you, seriously, if you're honest, 2017, you're like the humiliating gap between who I want to be and who I actually am is larger. One of my favorite quotes uh, that I've used before, but I love it particularly this time of year, is on the concept of misliving. It says this, there's a danger that you will mislive, that despite all your activity, despite all the pleasant diversions you might have enjoyed while alive, you will end up living a bad life. There is, in other words, a danger that when you're on your deathbed, you will look back and realize that you wasted your one chance at living. Instead of spending your life pursuing something genuinely valuable, you squandered it because you allowed yourself to be distracted by the various bubbles that life has to offer. I don't want to get to the end of my life and be excellent and skilled and gifted at useless things. We live in a culture where you can be a black belt in, in nothing and feel good about yourself. And it doesn't translate. I have this conversation with my son right now. Just so you know, Nate, the scorecards and rankings on Xbox Live do not translate into any real life meaningful significant contribution or accomplishment. 
none of your employees are going to be like, oh my gosh, really? That many kills in that period of time? You're hired. <laughs> we don't want to mislive. And so it's important that we get this sense of vision. And so I've, I've selected this text tonight. This is from the start of Mark's gospel because this is where Jesus bursts on the scene and gives to a thirsty, hungry, aching culture a fresh vision of possibility. So tonight's talk is quite simple. And I want to start just with this first point on kingdom vision. In verse 12, it says this, At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended him. And after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, whenever we talk about kingdoms, it's something that we struggle to understand. We are at least theoretically living in a democracy. And it's one of those places where hopefully it's the government of of the people, by the people, for the people. So whenever you talk about a kingdom, that feels like very, very distant for us. And in some senses, it feels very threatening. And even if you grew up in a country where there's language of the kingdom, I, I grew up in Australia, we're part of the Commonwealth, and the queen and the royal family are at best symbolic. And they fall into the category of celebrities rather than to the categories of rulers that you take seriously. Rulers that you think determine the fate and the outcome of things. So whenever we talk about kingdoms, it can be challenging to understand the language here and why this is such an impressive claim. But to summarize this quickly, basically using Dallas Willard's language, a kingdom is basically just a realm of effective will. It's that space where you get what you want done and accomplished. You have rule and reign over a certain area. Our kingdom is simply the range of our effective will. Whatever we genuinely have the say over is in our kingdom. And now having the say over something is precisely what places it within our kingdom. So I want you to see this clearly. Jesus shows up on the scene. There's been almost or just over 400 years of total silence, massive hungering, massive longing. And then Jesus breaks that silence by saying, that kingdom you long for, it's here. And I'm announcing it as good news to you. Now, obviously, it's important to put in context that at the time of Jesus, kingdoms were in conflict. This wasn't a blank slate. Jesus wasn't, this is not the Garden of Eden. Jesus wasn't announcing a neutral kingdom. This was a, a kingdom that was in direct contrast to the kingdom of Satan. Now, I know that whenever you talk about Satan in a place like New York, often people, they just get a little uptight or they're just like, it was going so good up until now. But I just, I, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that if we, don't, if we don't have some sort of concept of personal or personified evil, we will lack the explanatory power for the grief and heartache we see in our world. So there, there has to be, an, this isn't just like people having a bad day. There's legitimate evil in the world and that evil is embodied in a person and that person, when he exercises his will and his realm, he brings death, he brings destruction, but more than anything, it's defined by selfishness. And what he wants, what the enemy wants, is to be God. Look what it says in Luke 4. The devil led Jesus up into a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to them, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It's been given to me and I'll give it to anyone I want if you worship me. Anton LaVey, founder of the Church of Satan, says this, We don't worship Satan, we worship ourselves using the metaphorical representation of the qualities of Satan. Satan is the name used by Judeo-Christians for that force of individuality and pride within us. So, the kingdom that Jesus is coming to confront is the kingdom of Satan, but it could be described as the kingdom of self. Calvin says this, Everyone flatters himself and carries a kingdom in his breast. Now, you may, you know, I'd never do that. No, you, you do that all the time. You flatter yourself and you carry a kingdom in your, in your heart. Now you, this, this, now, you may experience minor frustrations, but this really begins to hash it out, this contest of wills, when you get married. So if you don't believe that, no, I, 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 don't have, I don't carry a kingdom and think I'm better than anybody else, just get into a serious relationship. I thought marriage was all about like crazy good sex and like sharing finances and then Instagram worthy road trips. I was just like, it's going to be incredible. <laughs> but what I, what I realized is that, 
<laughs> my wife just said, what I realized, <laughs> what we realized together is that there's two people with two kingdoms and they clash. Last night while preparing this sermon and meditating on this point, I did fall down a wormhole of personality theory in marriage. And looking at my wife's personality theory and my personality theory, our marriage style was summed up by the word, and I kid you not, volatile. <laughs> volatile. And I said that to my wife and heard that laugh that you've come to know and love from the bedroom I'm in my study. Volatile. Just the clashing of the kingdom of self. But listen... This is why this is important. Almost everything that's wrong with our world is because kingdoms exist based on selfishness. Institutionalized, systematized, structural selfishness. This is what we rage against. This is the quest for justice. This is the cry of our hearts. And James puts it like this in James 3. If you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts... Do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder, every evil practice, and Manhattan addresses. That's what it says right here in James 3. Because we are in a city that is built on envy and selfish ambition, and so much of the brokenness we see is disorder and evil practice. And when an individual gains power and cultural influence and have the ability to extend and exert their will, if they use everybody for their own glory, if they're selfish, if they're cruel, if they're trying to put other people down, if they're trying to extract from others basically as economic units without seeing their humanity, that's when our culture grieves and it weeps. And so Jesus' announcement that he is coming to bring a kingdom, the kingdom of God, is good news when we live in a culture defined by the kingdom of Satan and defined by the kingdom of self. And so Jesus comes to bring the kingdom of God. Listen in contrast. Listen to what it says about the kingdom of God. Going on in the book of James, it says this. The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow on peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So how don't we ache for a culture where the people who exert their wills on everybody else are not unspiritual and demonic and they're not driven by envy and selfish ambition and the fruit of the leadership is not disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from the kingdom of heaven, listen to the words, consider it, submissive, full of mercy, impartial, sincere. So the announcement of the kingdom of God is good news. God has stepped into the brokenness of human history and he is bringing his kingdom now. It is the rule and the reign where God, who is love, who is mercy, who is kind, where he gets what he wants done in the world. And Jesus says, this is good news to be brought to everybody. So this good news then, second point, demands a response. We read this in verse 15. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, obviously, and I'm sure that some of you suspect this, the Greek word that's used here is not the word chronos, it's the word kairos. And the word kairos is an appointed season. And so Jesus makes the announcement, announcement, not just that there's another event happening that just happens to be in the calendar, but God is bringing a, a new season or a new epoch into existence, and that time is now. And this is why this is very good news for us, because God's time is not dependent on human events or the current horizon. So we don't need the world to get awesome before God can work. The kingdom of God can break in here. It can break in now in surprising ways. Listen to how, uh, to how D.A. Garland puts it in his commentary. Jesus makes his appearance when the time Kairos is fulfilled. Luke fixes that time chronologically in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, and during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. Mark is not interested in telling us when precisely this occurred on the human calendar. The only thing that counts for him is the time seen from the divine side. 
When God steps onto the stage of human history, it always comes as a surprise and as a scandal to those whose field of vision is limited to finite human possibilities and whose time is measured only by the tenure of transient human kings. In the midst of the present moment, one can easily forget that God, and here's your word of the night, write this in your booklet, bestrides time and history and works by a different clock. Tell me about your God. He bestrides time and history. Works by a different clock. So the response is that this kingdom is available now to us and that our call is to recognize that in our midst and to believe this good news. Now, again, I'm sorry for the repeat because I'm sure some of you heard this, but it was all just coming together in my mind so clearly. The inbreaking of the news of God is not just another announcement. It's not where you have an opinion of it. It is a a fact and a reality. So what you think about God's kingdom is irrelevant. It's coming with or without you. But you have the invitation to be a part of it. And so I love this inbreaking. This, again, is the phrase, you catastrophe, and I love this. We know that right now our culture is suffocating under catastrophe after after catastrophe. But what about you catastrophes? J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings, often employed a storytelling device he called a you catastrophe. A you catastrophe is an unexpected, uh, a catastrophe is an unexpected evil, but Tolkien added the Greek prefix you meaning good to express the unexpected appearing of goodness. He defined it as the sudden happy turn in the story, which pierces you with a joy that brings you to tears. It has this effect on us because it's a sudden glimpse of truth in which we feel a sudden relief as if a major limb out of joint has suddenly snapped back. Repeatedly in his stories, a catastrophe occurs just as all hope appears to be lost. This is when the eagles swoop in and rescue. This is the riders of Rohan arriving at the battle. This is Gandalf the White appearing with the break of day. This is a (laughs) eucatastrophe. So, the kingdom of God is God's appointed time, not dependent on human events or the current climate or horizon where good news, a eucatastrophe, breaks in. And so God's call then for us is to repent, to stop going our own way and to turn wholeheartedly to be a part of this kingdom. Now, repentance, if I can think of a word that resonates less with modern Americans who don't follow God than repent, I can't think of one. Maybe evangelical, I don't know. They're tied up the top there. People, when you walk through Times Square, if you uh, had the privilege of walking through there on your way to church, I'm sure that Jesus' people were there with the signs, repent, repent, repent. Repentance has been taken hostage and it's lost its meaning in our culture. We hate repentance because it's been used as a tool of oppression to beat sinners down. People don't want to repent anymore because we live in a generation with a human penchant to become infuriated that anybody would demand that somebody else change in accordance with somebody else's beliefs. We don't like repentance because our culture has a shallow view of sin, almost a cartoon version of sin. And finally, our contemporary culture has a shallow view of repentance. Many have washed, deodorized, perfumed their spiritual lives through a variety of religious rituals, podcasts, mashups, and groups. So they believe they've done their duty before God, while underneath the real stuff we're trying to get to lurks around. In some sense, we're like the King Claudius and Hamlet who asks, may one be pardoned and retain the offense? Or King Herod in Adams for the time being who boasts, I am committing crimes and God likes forgiving them. Really, the world is admirably arranged. And isn't that true? It's just like, I love Christianity. God loves to forgive sin and I love to sin. This is the best faith ever. We have a false view of repentance. But repentance is not just about behavior modification or not taking sin seriously. It is a total change of mind leading to a total change of life. And so here's Jesus' announcement. God is breaking into the world. Stop whatever you're doing and reorient the kingdom of self towards that project. This is where meaning and life and joy are ultimately to be found. We don't just turn away from something, we turn to something. And this is the component of the gospel called belief. Now, to use an analogy here, I love this analogy. It was too long to put on the screen, but just listen along as... I give you the best example I've ever read of what it looks like when the kingdom of God breaks in. This is obviously Dallas Willard. 
as a child, I lived in an area of southern Missouri where electricity was available only in the form of lightning. We had more of that than we could use. But in my senior year of high school, the REA, the Rural, Rural Electrification Administration, extended its lines into the area where we lived and electrical power became available to households and farms. When those lines came by our farm, a very different way of life presented itself. Our relationships to fundamental aspects of life, daylight and dark, hot and cold, clean and dirty, work and leisure, preparing food and preserving it, could then be vastly changed for the better. But we still had to believe in the electricity and its arrangements, understand them and take the practical steps involved in relying on it. You may think the comparison rather crude, and in some respects it is, but it will help us to understand Jesus' basic message about the kingdom of the heavens if we pause to reflect on those farmers who, in effect, heard the message. Repent, for electricity is at hand. Repent, turn from your kerosene lamps and lanterns. Repent from your ice boxes and cellars, your scrub wards and rug heat beaters, the woman-powered sewing machines, and your radios with dry cell batteries. The power that could make their lives for better was right there near them where, by making relatively simple arrangements, they could utilize it. Strangely, a few did not accept it. They did not enter the kingdom of electricity. Some just didn't want to change. Others could not afford it, or so they thought. And similarly, the kingdom of God is also right beside us. It is indeed the kingdom among us. You can reach it from your heart with your mouth, even after a shaky and stumbling confidence and confession that Jesus is the death-conquering master of all. Now, some of you, um, you, you may not be a Christian, and maybe you've been brought here by someone who's a Christian. And to be honest, they're a little too emotionally intense for you. And you're like, oh, gosh, a little too much enthusiasm about God. But I want you to imagine somebody who's lived their entire life, or AK just gone camping for a week, and then you come back, and you, you just turn a light on. Imagine the first time the family gathered around to turn the light on at dark. And they're like, oh my gosh, turn it off. Turn it off again. Turn it on, turn it off. And you can imagine them going through the whole house and saying everything. So you imagine the initial excitement of their entire life moving from the Stone Age into the you know, electricity. This would have been life altering. Now listen, that's what's happened to people who have just discovered the power of God through the kingdom of God flowing into their lives. They're like, look, I was dead in sin and now I have spiritual life. I was in guilt, shame, condemnation. I was a slave, but now I've been set free by Jesus. Excuse me while I turn the, the thing on and off a little bit. My whole life's been changed. And then eventually, they get used to it. But my point is at the start of it, my point, at the start of it, there's something amazing. That's what's happening to those people. They're experiencing the redeeming, loving power of God flowing into their dead, self-condemned, shame-filled hearts. And it brings people joy. So it's not just enough to mentally acknowledge it. We have, to, we have to choose to align our lives and access it. So Jesus says, look, the kingdom, you need the right vision. The kingdom is available. And a good king with a good heart, who when he gets in power is humble and loving and gracious and kind, welcoming and forgiving, just and fair. He's now bringing his rule and reign, his range of effective will to the world. And he says to you, turn from your darkness, turn from your own ways, and come on board with the kingdom of God. It's available. Life, healing, joy, forgiveness, peace, power, belonging. It's flowing through the human race. It's being announced to you. And all you have to do is respond. Repentance and faith. But then Jesus does something I think that's very interesting uh, in point three, verse 16. He invites people as his disciples to learn to live in this kingdom. Look at what he says, verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he'd gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with a hired man. And they followed him. Now, just a couple of quick points I want to make from this passage here. Number one, I want you to see something extraordinary about this call. This, is, this clarifies a misunderstanding about Christianity that a lot of people have. Jesus' invitation was relational and personal. 
He said, follow me. Now, prophets in the Old Testament would always point people back to God. But Jesus didn't say, follow God. He said, follow me. And often other rabbis at the time of Jesus would call people to be disciples, but they would call them to be disciples of their teaching or their Torah. It was their understanding of the text. Jesus doesn't point people towards a distant deity or religious obligation. He points them personally to himself. It's by relationship with me, Jesus says, you will learn to live in this kingdom, to become citizens of it yourself. So the call is a personal call to be mentored by Jesus in how to master the art of living. Then he gives them a commission, and he says this, I will make you fishers of men. Now, Jesus didn't invent the term fishers of men, and that day it was a common description of philosophers and teachers who captured men's minds through teaching and persuasion. They would bait the hook. The teachings would catch disciples. And it's, like, and, and, and it's, it's fascinating that Jesus employs a commonly used metaphor. But I want you to see this, because this, this was one of the things that was the biggest thing that put me off Christianity. I thought, look, I, I had a pretty good life my teenage years. I was enjoying myself. I, I was like a happy pagan. And I didn't become a Christian because I felt guilty and overwhelmed. I was just like living the good life. And I ultimately became a Christian because I saw people living in the kingdom of God with such joy and passion. I was like, what is that? Like, this is Christianity. This is following Jesus. Like, that's, the, that's better than what I'm doing. I just never seen people so alive in the kingdom of God. And I want you to see this. When you choose to follow Jesus, this expands the horizon of possibility for your life. Following Jesus opens doors, opens possibilities, opens what is possible in your life. It doesn't close or make your life small. Listen to what one commentator says. I love this. First it meant, this is in the disciples following Jesus. First it meant an immensely expanded life. The horizon of these fishermen's lives was bound by the margins of Galilee. Once in a while, they were drawn to Jerusalem for a festival. But by and large, they knew little more than the deck of their boat, the currents of the lake, and the handful of people in the marketplace. The conversation consisted of trade talk, local gossip, family affairs, and Galilean politics. In a word, they were remarkably provincial, even to the extent of having their own telltale accent. Then Christ came. And how their world changed. John went from the seas of Galilee to become the bishop of Ephesus. Peter went to become the bishop of Rome. Andrew went as far as the borders of Russia. Their hearts were enlarged to take in the whole world. Their minds once circumscribed and committed to the smallest interest, now overflowed with profound thought. They became theologians, thinkers, sociologists, psychologists, and strategists. All because Jesus said, follow me, and they obeyed him. Charles Spurgeon puts it like this. When Christ calls us by his grace, we ought not only to remember what we are, but we ought also to think of what he can make us. It did not seem a likely thing that low, lowly fishermen would develop into apostles. The men so handy with the net would be quite as much at home in preaching sermons and instructing converts. One would have said, how can this be? You cannot make founders of churches out of peasants of Galilee. That is exactly what Christ did. And when we are brought low in the sight of God by a sense of our own unworthiness, we may feel encouraged to follow Jesus because of what he can make us. Oh, you who see in yourselves at present nothing that is desirable, come you and follow Christ for the sake of what he can make out of you. That's not Joel Osteen. That's Charles Spurgeon. What he can do in your life, who you will become when you follow Jesus. Yesterday, um, I was having lunch with Nate, steak fajitas, and in just a few months, he's going off. He's doing a one year mission trip. It's amazing. They just added a country, so this time next year, he'll be in Nepal. But I was just, I was just, and okay, look, I confess, we're doing the Enneagram test together. So we're going through the Enneagram test, and I was like, look, I just want to understand your heart more and your core motivation and fears. So he does the, he does the Enneagram, and uh, we just, it just leads to this profound, deep conversation about longings. What do you long for? Who you are becoming will last forever. Absurdity, sin, foolishness, 
cultural cuteness are fun to chuckle at for a minute, but they are no place to live in or to become in our culture. And so you, so I've, you get in these small groups, and I had to shut small groups down just like I'm done with this group because you get in a group, it's like, I'm really struggling. Okay, great. Then two years later, like, I'm, I'm really struggling. It's great. Like nine years later, I'm really struggling. And it's like, look, at some point, you're going to make your decision. And that decision is going to be immediate obedience. I'm not saying there's not still going to be temptation. I'm not talking about things like that. I'm talking about consciously choosing not to immediately respond. The king is advancing. You're invited to play a role. The only thing that will close the horizon of possibility in your life that God wants to open to impact in ways that you cannot fathom is disobedience. Disobedience closes the horizon of possibility of God's work in your life. So it will always be you and not God shutting down what is possible through you. So I just made a commitment this week, no matter how weird it gets this year, so thank you for your congregational grace for me. No matter how weird it is, if I sense it, I'm acting on it immediately. And I, I just took, yes, I took a, um, so I experienced this, and I, it's very hard to articulate this crazy encounter I had with God the other morning. But I'm just sitting there and I just have this, I just feel the Holy Spirit say to me, you're going to be tested today. This is a test for what's in your heart. And I'm like, oh, I'm not, you know what's in my heart? Let's skip the test. But it just didn't work like that. I entered into this moment of testing. I felt like I was being torn in two. And then the only thing that got me through it was this sense, is this promise. It says, if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. And he will come to us and make his home in us. I said, so the only thing that was overwhelmed the power of feeling like my soul was being ripped in two was the promise of an increase of an awareness of the presence of God. And so I consciously obeyed. I'm going to obey. I, I just, I don't even entertain. I obey, I obey. And it was like a wave of the presence of God filled my apartment. And I was just sitting there going, this is, this is worth it. If this is what obedience is, I choose this every time. Strengthen the immediate desire of my heart. I just, I just, I'm just sharing my personal testimony from this week to encourage you. When sin comes at you to tempt you, don't, don't like, and to just fight back, yell at it, fight it, resist, speak to it. Yes, that's right. Yelling at it. I'm saying, preach sermons to your sin, not today. Horizons opening, you know, whatever it takes. Only saying that because I think the joy that comes. Now, if you're not a Christian, you're like, oh, you got a little animated there. <laughs> listen, listen. Don't you wish that Christians live with integrity instead of hypocrisy? And if it takes like a little animation that we live out what we believe, please be patient. Okay. Okay. In the calling of disciples, in the calling of disciples, is that those who are drafted, this is so encouraging, those who are drafted apparently have no special preparation. Jesus does not choose the most socially prominent, the best trained, or even the most religiously devout. He doesn't find them in some hallowed religious setting, such as the synagogue. He's just passing by and finds them in the midst of everyday life, going about their daily routines. His command, however, shatters their comfortable everyday world. I love that. So I want us to be walking around with a different spirit than the spirit of our culture. The spirit of our culture says God can't do anything until we get a better president. And God can't do anything until we have better leaders. And God can't do anything. God's doing whatever He wants. And what He wants is people who are available, who will immediately respond, who say, I choose to live out of Kairos time, not Kronos time. I'm not going to define my life by whichever emperor is in power or whoever high priest is currently in power. The kingdom of God is available. I repent. I believe I'm entering in. The kingdom of electricity is going to flow through my life. I'm going to align myself. Okay, that's the end of the Bible teaching. Are you all still with me? Okay, so what I would like to do now is I just want to make this super practical, Okay. Okay, okay, yes, it was not rhetorical. It was actually it's good. So, there's, if you've ever been in a small group with me or a discipleship thingy, whatever, you've seen this, but I just want this to be a part of our culture. So, get your little, um, 
get you, by the way, props to the creative team for creating this cultural artifact. Thank you. So just get, get it out, get your pen out. I'll just, I want you to draw this because this is how to access more of the kingdom of God in your life, okay? So I'm just going to take you through a very simple exercise. Now, I want to give full credit. Um, about 10 years ago, I was, uh, this is when, when New York was a coffee desert, coffee desert. And there was no third way coffee movement happening yet. And then I remember walking past this sign. It was like a, like a New Testament sign. It said Stumptown Coffee. And the Ace Hotel was opening. And they're putting Stumptown in there. I would line up an hour at times just to get proper coffee. It was amazing. So when my, one of my spiritual fathers comes to town, there's a guy named Mike Breen, wonderful guy. And he comes to town. So I took him to this coffee shop. And I just said to him, look, man, I'm teaching on the kingdom. I'm teaching on the kingdom. But I'm I'd, I'd struggling to translate to Manhattan. Like, how do you get people a process? And he's proper British. So he's like, do you have a pen, John? So I'm like, yes, I do. So I get my pen. Do you have a napkin? So I get the napkin. And then he basically draws this on a napkin. So I just want to show you this. And here's why I want to show you this. Your, your practical application of this this week is to, is to do this yourself, okay? And then share this with somebody else in our community. That's it. You can't come back to church next week if you don't do it. Because Jesus says you have a culture of delusion in your life. You deceive yourself. Your life will collapse. You've got to do it, okay? You actually can come back, okay? But I just wanted to just say what Jesus said. All right. <laughs> we, are ta- we are saying yes to the kingdom of God. It's breaking into the world. And we want more of the range of God's effective will to fill the earth. Okay, so what we're looking for next is we're looking for these Kairos moments. We're looking for these moments where we just go, look, man, that felt, that felt really different. That wasn't just like another chronological event. Something happened. And it can look like this. Maybe it can be, hey, man, I had a conversation with someone. They, in a passing comment, said something that I've thought about for two days. Like, why? Why did that stand out so much? Maybe it's something that's happening at work. Maybe it's in, in an area of relationship. Maybe it's something in your heart. Maybe it's something you read. But that is God's invitation for the kingdom of God to take ground in your life. So this is next. This is like a learning circle, and it's about repentance and belief. Okay? So step number one, here's what we do. We acknowledge these moments next, and then what we do is we observe these. We, we try and get a little objective distance and say, what is actually happening here? Like, what's really going on? What, why? What? Try and get clarity on it. Next. Then you want to reflect deeply on it. So here's what it was, and now you're sort of looking around it. You're mining. You're trying to make sense of it. You're trying to sort of sit with it, trying to get to the heart of it. Next, then you try and discover what God's doing here. And the goal of this is repentance. It's it's acknowledging something's happening and then leaning into it. And then you want to not just, and this is where a lot of Christians go, yeah, so I just felt like I was doing this in my life. Like, thanks for sharing. Next, But that's not what we're doing. Next, have a look at this. Next part is you've got to have a plan. How are you going to obey Jesus immediately? What's God asking you to do? Next, this is not just you and Jesus. You need challenge and support. It has to be spoken out to people. People need to know. The best ways we actually love and spur one another on is by saying, what's God doing in your life right now? How can I pray for you? How can I encourage you? How can I hold you accountable? How can I inspire you? When we have an awareness of the Kairos season that we're in, it gives other people the ability to skillfully, skillfully love us. Without it, it's sort of like general New Testament love. But when we're aware of it, it becomes skillful and we feel it and we're strengthened. And then next, we get accountability on it. Next slide. And then we begin to act on it. And you know what it does? It increases an awareness of God's presence. And the area of our life that was maybe blocked up or wasn't yielded, the kingdom of God takes ground. And there's another area or part of our life where there's more of the range of God's effective will inside of us. Look, you see this in Peter's life. You just take this principle on Peter's life, and Peter's life is a series of Kairos moments where God invites him into a journey of repentance and belief. Now, here's why I love this. There's a lot of talk. I'm just totally off script now like we're having coffee. There's a lot of talk in our world about being gospel-centered, But every time I hear it, it feels like a cycle of Old Testament death. You suck, you failed, go back to the cross and then struggle all week with your idols. And then next week, go back to church where you'll be a reminder that you suck and you take communion and thank God for the cross. No, I'm serious. 
And it just is like a beat down. But this is cycling up into the kingdom. This is, this is opening more of your soul to territory where God comes in and He begins to rule and He begins to reign. So I love this vision. I want to repent. I want to pay attention and then I want to respond. Now look, if the circle doesn't work for you, that's fine. But I'll just say this. All of life is about cycles. You are either right now in a cycle of mediocrity or you're circling up or you're spiraling down. But life is a series of circles. And so this is one of those ways that we can consciously sit and say, where's God moving in my life? And when you know this and when you share it, and when you're praying into it, when you're resisting temptation in light of it, when you have accountability, this is how you take these beautiful theories of the kingdom of God and you live them out in everyday life. And you never know what breakthroughs and what promises and what fruit and what blessing is behind one of these Kairos invitations. You never know. You never know. I was a kid sitting in a youth group room I didn't want to be in. And I'm at the back of the room with my arms folded. First time I go there, and the youth pastor from the front says, hey, you with the blonde hair at the back. And I knew it was me because I just dyed it basically white. And he said this, you think you're here for your own reason." But God's hands on your life. I could have said, oh, that's weird. But I just was like, wow, what a concept. What, is it, what does it mean that God's hands on your life? What does that phrase mean? And so I explored it. And 20 years later, I'm here preaching to you tonight because I just entered into a moment. You never know what God will unlock when you take the time to walk in the kingdom of God and you never know. Okay, I'm closing. Um, I don't know how this happened and I've got a confession to make to you. I don't know how this happened and I normally resist advertising so well but in like my Facebook feed and my Instagram feed every other image was a picture advertising master classes. Has this happened to any of you? It's like you can take a photography class with Annie Leibovitz. Really? You can take a basketball class with Steph Curry. Really? You can take a screenwriting class with Aaron Sorkin. Oh. Well, I'm, I like eating. I don't like cooking. But Gordon Ramsay's the one teaching it. So now I'm interested. Steve Martin's teaching the comedy masterclass. Fashion design with Mark Jacobs tennis with Serena Williams and at this point I'm thinking how did they get all these people to teach master classes acting with Samuel L. Jackson and this is what got me filmmaking with Martin Scorsese boom I go to the website I'm like okay you wore me down I want to take a master class and then you had a choice you buy one class it's $90 or you could buy a yearly pass take all classes for 180 and I was like 180 it is I'm a freaking master class taker. <laughs> and when I get done paying, I just hear the Holy Spirit say to me, John, if you want, I can teach you to master the art of living. If you want, I'll teach you how to master life. Dallas Willard says this, the really good news for humanity is that Jesus is now taking students in the master class of life. The really good news. You want to have to learn to live in freedom and joy. You want to know power. You want to have your sins forgiven. You want to be a part of a cause that transcends anything you can imagine in terms of success and significance. Enroll in the school of life that Jesus is teaching. So Jesus' invitation is simple. Look, the kingdom of God, it's coming. And you're invited follow him follow me repent believe and as you do this you will learn what it means to be a disciple of jesus so that's my primary passion this year yes i will cook with gordon ramsay i will bowl with curry i will laugh with martin but i will master the art of living because 2018 is a year. It's going to happen. 
What's going to happen in your 2018? Is 2018 is going to happen. But let's just determine together. 2018 is a year where we all embrace Jesus' vision and we learn to take classes from Jesus and master the art of life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the good news of your kingdom. And Lord, as fully as we know how, we just say yes to your kingdom. We just, we hear the announcement of the, of the kingdom of God at hand. Yes. Yes. We do not want to be those foolish people. The whole street's lit up. I've got little garrison, little heaters. Lord, we want the full power of the rule and reign of God to touch every area of our lives. So Holy Spirit, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would just wash over our congregation. Come Holy Spirit, we just pray. Every heart, every mind, every spirit, just lay it bare before you. And Father, I just pray, expose anything that is in opposition. The kingdom of self, subtle Satanism that says, you know what? I want the whole world to be about me. Expose it, Lord God. Teach us to turn away from it. Father, we just open every door of every room of our heart. Lord, we open our sexuality. We open our finances. We open our entertainment. We open our spare time. We just open everything to you, and we just want the rule and reign of God to fill our lives, Lord. Holy Spirit, I just pray in your power, just remove anything that is closing the horizon of possibility for our church. Remove it, Lord God. We want your full redemptive purposes and potential for this community to be realized. Jesus, this is your church. You are the head. And we want to follow you wherever you go immediately. So the 2018 is a year of increase for the kingdom of God. That's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we close in worship.